Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Art as Well. Happy New Year to you all. This is our first uh, episode of 2022. And um, I hope you all got through Christmas okay and hoping that things will improve. I have it in absolutely no authority whatsoever that things will improve for March of this year and we'll be able to get back together, hopefully. But anyway, you're all very welcome and thank you very much for, for tuning in this morning. Um, today we have uh, Dr. Brenda Moore McCann as, as our guest. Now, I was fortunate to uh, meet Brenda um, at a dinner from the Contemporary Irish Arts Society um, uh, annual dinner. And I was sitting beside her and had a great chat with her. And I thought, wow, wouldn't she be great now to have on uh, the show? So I'm delighted she, she agreed to do so. Um, she is a medical doctor. She trained as a medical doctor. Um, she met her husband while studying medicine in UCD, but then went on to do all sorts of various things, um, which culminated in doing a degree in art history in Trinity. Um, and all sorts of things have evolved out of that and, and uh, have contributed to a most interesting uh, career and life. Um, so without further ado, let's go at, over to Brenda, all the way over in Dublin, same place and say hello to her. Good morning, Brenda. How are you? Morning, Alan. Thank you. All it's well. A pleasure. pleasure to be here. Thank you. Not yeah. at all. And listen, before we start, I must ask you about your husband, who I also met at that dinner. Uh, mm -hmm. How is he getting on? He's, he's doing much better. Thank you. Um, yeah. Yes, he, he's uh, doing very well now in hospital and I expect to be home in a few days. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they've sorted out all the issues that... They did. They did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the dreaded coronavirus, but uh, yep. he has some particular background issues which have caused uh, extra problems, but yep. he's doing okay now. He's doing Good. okay. In the yeah. right hands. Excellent. I'm delighted Thank to hear you. that. I'm sending my yeah. best because yeah. I was hoping that he might do a cameo appearance. <laughs> <laughs> he said, before he left for hospital, he said, no, he wouldn't do that. Oh, did he? Oh, then forget <laughs> it. No, he likes the limelight, you see. <laughs> <laughs> I see. So listen, tell us about, um, you know, I think we'll start when you went to medical school because there's so much happened since. Um, yeah. Tell us about that. Why did you do medicine, Brenda? Well, can I just um, do the typical politician thing and say, well, can I, before I answer that question, can I just say, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm really, really pleased to be on this program. Not bec and I, because I, when I first came across your program, I uh, was struck by how open-ended it was uh, within the uh, cultural field. Um, you know that you were introducing me to artists I'd never heard of before, also to artists I, I was aware of and knew about, but also well-known and established artists. So a very broad uh, range, I thought, and also that you were interested in interviewing gallery gallerists. I found that interesting. So asking me as an art historian, I think, uh, is a further extension of that broad reach that you have uh, created. And I'm particularly glad that I represent uh, people who write about art. I, with, I write about art, I, uh, like art critics write about art, the curators write about art, and all of us uh, contribute behind the scenes to the overall cultural field. And the general public really are very often unaware of people like us, mm. but um, particularly since the broadsheet newspapers um, have a declining, uh, ever regretful declining interest in uh, talking about what artists are doing. Mm. So if we don't write about what artists are doing, uh, there's, there will be nothing to document what's going on in the cultural field in yeah. our own time. Yeah. Absolutely. And, yeah. and for the future. Uh, art historians will, won't have documents to look back at to, to uh, pull together uh, aspects of how artists see the world uh, mm. in our particular period, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm very glad, not just because it's me, but uh, because of your recognition of this uh, if you like, unseen role that mm. uh, writers on art play and the support that it gives artists work. Yeah. So well, I, thank, well, thank you for that. Not at all. And thank you. Thank mm. you very much. I wasn't expecting <laughs> you to say that. But um, 
No, I mean, what really fascinated me about you was, was this particular angle of, of how you brought uh, art into the world of medicine. And yeah. I think that's a very, very unique thing. And, and, and uh, if I could tell everybody before you explain what we're saying, yeah. but basically in 2008, um, you were invited to create a humanities model module uh, in the Faculty of Medicine um, in Trinity. And basically what you were trying to do there was to bring another dimension into the world of medicine, which can be very scientific, very blind, focused in, in a particular area without consideration of the human side of, of medicine. That's right. And you brought that in and, and your observational things, and we'll do a little test of everybody yeah. later on. Okay. But tell us how that arose, because I, I find that really interesting and certainly something that our viewers would be interested in knowing. Yeah, about. Um, it's something, wearing two hats um, very often gives you double a double way of viewing things. And so moving between one world and another, I myself began to see the world in a different kind of way from uh, when I was a, a practicing doctor. Mm -hmm. um, that might be a function of me just getting older, uh, of course, but I think it, it has enriched my life enormously. It has changed the way I think. Um, and, and I'm beginning, I see through the eyes of artists, things that I wouldn't necessarily have noticed or seen before. So if that could happen to me, I kind of felt when I was asked to take this on in Trinity, they asked me, first of all, whether I would just do a, um, an art history course. Hmm. And I thought, mm, no, I, I don't, I want to do something that brings these two fields together in some way, of which I've experienced both. And so I realized, and of course, once you realize it, it's very obvious, I realized that all art and all medicine begins with the very starting point is observation, looking. Mm. Uh, we look at a patient the minute they walk into our room, we're looking at their gait, we look at, we, we, we examine like their eyes, we're, we can tell so much about a patient before they open their mouth even. Mm. And so I thought observation, and so I thought that probably a good way to do it would be to uh, use uh, visual art as, as a, uh, an educational tool. Mm. Emphasizing to the students that they didn't have to have any uh, knowledge of art or art history. And even if they did, they should leave it at the door uh, because this is just purely looking and seeing. And I came across some very interesting uh, work that was done in, in America um, by an Abigail Houston and it's called, it's now quite well known, Visual Thinking Strategies. And I think one of your artists, um, maybe more than one, but used this in her own teaching. But it's based, the form, the basis of what I do. And basically it's, uh, it's based on three very simple kind of questions. You put, ask somebody to look at something, you say, what do you see? And then the second question is, why do you say that? And then the third one is, if you if you look a little bit more carefully, can you see anything else? Mm. So it's all it's quite simple, but it's not. Uh, it really the whole process is designed to get people to slow down yeah. uh, the whole process <clears throat> of looking because. So much of our lives, we glance at things, we skim over things, we don't, we look, but we don't see. Yes. And so it's about, it's really about that. And yes. in Trinity, I developed this module called Perception in Medicine and Art. So since 2008, these are, are the modules that have been uh, developed uh, within uh, the medical humanities in Trinity College. Mine is up there at 12 o'clock. But you, have, you can see the, all the other ones, literature and medicine, film and medicine, philosophy and arts and health and medicine and power is an interesting one, medicine and society, history of medicine and so on. So basically the students can choose any one of these, but they are compulsory. They have to do the, the, the actual course. And Brenda, yeah. before this, this was introduced, uh, were any of these subjects dealt with or, or offered to medical students? Uh, 
Well, in Trinity, uh, there has been for a long, long time, uh, medical students were invited to go to other uh, faculties and they could sit in and they could go to whichever faculty they liked and they would then get a, a Bachelor of Arts degree at the end of it. But as some of them, uh, older people who've gone to Trinity uh, mentioned to me, a lot of them didn't really bother too much with it. Some did, like Mary Henry, for example, uh, Senator Mary Henry, she is very very interested in art and she uh, went to the uh, art history lectures um, but other people didn't really uh, take it too seriously they do the same in the United States where you get a bachelor's of arts degree so the, and the idea of that is to broaden the, the the perspective of the forthcoming doctor you know the uh, emergent doctor mm. and that's in recent years uh, everyone is aware that technology, it just absolutely dominates our lives now. And of course it is, dom it dominates medicine as well. Yeah. And I, I have written, I've published on this particular topic myself, but uh, I'm not the only one to see regretfully that this has to, in some ways, interfered with the traditional doctor-patient relationship, yeah. the, the, the trust that you build up because the machine is getting in the way. And very often, some doctors don't even look at you. They just are looking at the computer as they're talking to you. So, yeah. so this is all uh, something that the humanities have been brought in in the United States and the UK. Um, I'm not so sure about Italy, um, because in Italy, uh, people learn uh, about uh, philosophy and literature and so on at school yes. um, to a greater degree uh, than we here. Um, so anyway, that's why the yeah. humanities were brought into many medical schools and the students love it. The students really, really love it. It's hard to assess, though, um, because you'd really want to have a lot of money to do the kind of research to follow these students through into their practice, into their lives. Sure. And did it, how mm. much of, a, of an impact did it make? But all of us who teach, you might ask the same question, you know, how do you know what you are teaching, what impact it has? And of course, medicine is different because... Andrea there, who's a professor teaching in, in, in Rome, you have to make sure that the doctor is safe. Yes. But of course, that's um, science has formed the basis as the scientific model that's used now in mm -hmm. teaching. And that to my mind is to the detriment of, of the other aspects of, of medical practice. I know, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's what, what the old fashioned term of bedside manner so yeah. suddenly became a yes. thing of the past. But, you know, I think I think it is being reintroduced because I think a lot of the, the results of the work you're doing, I've noticed in, in a small, you know, sample of one that doctors nowadays will, will start to show you exactly what they mean by their diagnosis. And they will take out charts and show you the inside of your ear and yes. say, this is what I'm talking about. Whereas yes. before that was just forget it, you know, don't yes. waste time. Yes. Well, you see, I mean, it's a it's a very complex subject. Um, and really, there is the problem of medicine and litigation. And in this country, we are the Irish are most litigious <laughs> group of people. We uh, sue doctors more frequently than patients sue doctors in the United, uh, United Kingdom, for example. Yeah, really? I don't know what the situation is in other countries. Mm. Um, so it's a kind of um, a disease, if you like, to use that terminology, that we have inherited from the in United States. And so a lot of doctors practice defensive medicine they oh, do. Right. We do tests just in case you might end up in a court of law, uh, and a lawyer says, "Oh, but you didn't do you didn't do the skull X-ray, yeah. you know, yes, um, yes. because your clinical judgment is no longer uh, acceptable in a court of law, mm, unfortunately." Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. So these it it's complicated by all of these issues and. Now there's 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 a few things I want to touch on, um, particularly your husband Sean's um, specialty. Yeah, uh, and how that brought you to America and probably elsewhere also okay. uh, various projects that you're involved in, like the blood project um, and, you know, various other bits and pieces. But before we do that, can, can we just do a little bit of entertainment for, okay. for, the, <laughs> for the viewers? And right. that is to do your observational test. OK, mm -hmm. now we, we'd like everyone to join in this. And what it is, is you're going to show or at least I'll, I'll show um, a Vermeer 
of maid and what is it? Mistress and maid. Mistress, Mistress and maid. So, I mean, if you're looking at this in a gallery or even on the screen, I would be saying to you, well, what what do you see? And you know, I, I with the students, I'd expect them first of all to tell me that it is a painting. Uh, so to identify what the object is. And as I often say to them, you have to pretend that I'm blind. So you have to make this answer, this answer very vivid to me so that I can see it, if you like, in my mind's eye. So if you describe, uh, you know, I see two women and you, you, you know, for accuracy, because we do this in medicine as well, you, you have to be accurate in the way you describe what you see on a patient's body or what symptoms they may have described to you. So uh, we call, the, there's a difference between symptoms and signs. Symptoms are what the patient complains of. A sign is what you can see or elicit from the patient's body. So, um, and just as an aside, sometimes I get really angry. I ring up uh, RTE, they, they talk about mad cow disease and they talk about the cows having symptoms. Well, of course, cows can't have symptoms and like babies can't have symptoms because they can't tell you. Uh, so, um, but anyhow, uh, so, the, in the description, if they say, oh, well, there's the woman, there's a seated woman, I'd expect them to be able to tell me how she's very well dressed and she's more elaborately dressed than the woman who's standing, handing her what appears to be a letter. So what can you deduce from uh, that description? You know, what is the relationship between the two women? Are they speaking to each other? How do you know they're speaking to each other? Well, you can uh, surmise they are because their mouths are open. Uh, the woman, the seated woman is making a gesture with her hand. What does that gesture mean to you? What could it mean? Um, and so what do you think is going on? Where is the light coming from is another question I would be asking. And you can tell that because the artist has told us or has shown us, so you can see the light on the forehead of the standing woman is brighter on the right side of her face than on the left side. So it would appear that the light is coming from the top left of the painting, outside of the painting. We can't see it, of course. And then I ask uh, the question of what, what do you think the woman was doing, the seated woman, and what would her gesture mean? So it looks like she, she was in the process of writing a letter. So it, this is a, a frozen moment in time. She stopped writing the letter as the, the other woman has come in. And so the other question I would ask is, well, does the artist, has the artist told us that there are uh, other windows in the room? Are there any other sources of light? And how can you tell? Mm. So if you look very, very carefully at the painting. But before you, before you do that, Brenda, should we I ask people I won't give the answer, her... so we'll just let people try and do it, okay? Yeah, let's let's do that. Yeah. So uh, the, the question is, how many sources of light are there? Yes. Right. G how given, many windows, given, I suppose we could say? Yeah, how how given, given the fact the that there's only one light source appearing to, you know, to hit the forehead and so on. That's right. Yeah. That's one. Okay. But yeah. are there others? Yes. All right. So that's the question. Mm -hmm. So um, just for the laugh, guys, would you like to write in your answers in the chat and, and put down one or none or whatever? We have one answer already. Oh, wait, from Barbara good. Bain. Barbara. Okay. Right. Anyone else? I'm not telling you you're right or wrong. <laughs> Karen, very good. Okay. Alico says right. two. Gillian says three. Morden says one. Right. This is this is very good. Anyone else? No. Okay. All right. Well, let's let's, let's leave it at that. Um, Peter says two, possibly three, depending on glass reflections. Ah. Oh, right. Well. Okay. Yeah. Andrea says two. Catherine, the light of the fabric is a second source. Yeah, <laughs> reflected light. Yeah. Interesting. Yes, yes. Good point. OK, I'm going to just get out of that for the moment and I'm going to blow up the um, the area that we're going to talk about. Yeah. I think Peter, Peter got near it. All right. Yeah. Or some some people got near it. All right. So if you if you look at the ink wells that are on the table, you can see uh, reflected light in the uh, being uh, reflected in the reflections of windows in the in the ink wells. 
So I would say three probably uh, is is correct. Well done, Gillian, my daughter. <laughs> she doesn't know about this. Right. Yeah. So it's interesting. So the point is that, you know, people will tend to look at the face and say, oh, yeah, there's light. You know, in my case, there's light coming from this way. There's light coming from that way. So yeah. there's two sources. That's right. Are they thinking about above me? Yeah. Do you know? And how many sources are there? Or behind or behind the, if you like, the far side of the picture frame, you know. Yeah. So there are things going on outside of the frame. Hmm. Uh, is the thing that that uh, we talk about uh, with yes. the with the students, and um, uh, not many of them get the reflections in the inkwells, um, and, and they get very puzzled. I, I showed this because Sean and I are on a, a an advisory uh, board uh, for the thing called a, a website called the Blood Project. It's run hmm. from Harvard, and. Um, I, I do this sort of thing. I put up a different image every month and I ask him those simple questions and then I give the answers on a different page. And um, they were, um, one of them was just saying, it was this, this was driving him crazy. He couldn't work out how many, where the light sources were. So anyway, yes. so it's something that can be done. You don't have, it's just, just by uh, intense observation you can find out a lot of things even if you don't know anything about the painting you don't know anything about the background of the, the subject or anything you can work out quite a number of things which a lot of people find is very exciting yes. and of course my purpose is that if the if you can do that with the painting you can do it with the patient and yeah. I would bring them to say a portrait the portrait gallery in in the national gallery and I put the students in front of a, a single portrait and mm -hmm. it would say, well, that's your patient. Where do you begin? So yeah. you have to, where do you start with the patient and where do you start with the painting? Yes. And uh, so it enables them, I think, uh, mm -hmm. to have more confidence in their own abilities. Yeah. Without relying on tests and machines all the time. Exactly. Which are necessary, of course. Don't get well, me wrong. Of course. Of, of course. But there's so many other aspects. And, and one of the projects yeah. that you've worked on is a thing called Open Window. Um, yeah. Now, before I say that, can you just explain, Sean, your husband, has been a pioneer in leukemia research and bone marrow transplant and so on. That's and right. I, I, I'm probably wrong in saying the way I'm saying it. But would yeah. you explain a little bit about Sean? Because I want I want then to show how patients have been dealt with using this open window. OK, well, I don't know if, oh, did I, I did you? Well, OK, um, hmm. yes. Um, a number of years ago, um, he, um, one of his patients actually, because patients who have been transplanted are in a very perilous situation mm. because their whole, their marrow is wiped out. They're very uh, prone to infection and uh, they have to be in a completely isolated uh, um, room surrounded by lots of machinery. So it's very clinical, very functional, very, very important to keep them alive. Um, they're not allowed to have pictures on the wall because you can get dust and then maybe infection and so on. So a patient, one of the patients, is, I mean, we've all got used to isolation and we all know how difficult it is, even when we're feeling well. So if you're not feeling well and you, you could die, you're contemplating your mortality. It's obviously a very different situation. Yeah. So one of his patients asked him, could she please have a, a pot of flowers outside uh, the exterior window mm. and that really started off what became the open window project just briefly he was determined to change the quality of the patient's life as they were incarcerated in this mm. very difficult situation and uh, collaborating with with uh, artists and he set up a committee I was on it and um, uh, nurses were on it uh, psychologists were on it and uh, basically built up this um, program for patients whereby they could have a, a virtual window projected onto the wall of, of their hospital room. Mm -hmm. And in that, they could have about nine channels that they could choose with a specially designed mouse for people who are very, very weak mm -hmm. and very fragile, uh, that they could choose. They had complete choice of which channel they could choose. And um, I provided a, a traditional 
uh, uh, bank of, of images. Maybe somebody loves Van Gogh's sunflowers and they could look at that if they wished. Uh, but we also commissioned artists and they uh, produced uh, videos uh, with music and very, very much slowed down the whole visual process that it became more a contemplative thing. It was something that was different from cinema and different from televisual imagery. Mm -hmm. So it was, but he, Sean, being a researcher, also did um, a, a randomized controlled trial because you won't impress medical doctors unless you have statistics in this day and age. So yeah. he did this and found that actually um, there was a statistically significant difference in patients who were exposed to the open window in terms of depression and anxiety and their attitude uh, to the forthcoming um, transplant that they were going to have. Pre and post effects. Yes, oh, yes. They, yeah. they they were. It was discussed with them by a research nurse at various uh, points throughout the uh, whole period that they were in the um, at post transplant, pre and post transplant. Yeah. So there was a control group who were patients who weren't exposed to open window and they had more uh, levels of anxiety and depression. Now they all got exactly the same medical treatment and care. Um, and it wasn't intended that this would cure them uh, or anything, but it just would in, improve the quality of their life as they were in this very difficult situation. Yes. Um, so it's been superseded now by um, much smarter technology uh, than we have. Like, look what we're doing now, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But yes. um, but it was it's very interesting. It got a lot of interest. In fact, the American army were very, very interested in it. Interesting. We brought it to, uh, it was presented to art people and medical people. Um, uh, unfortunately, a lot of doctors weren't that interested in it. Um, more um, meta um, people around uh, uh, patients were interested in it. Mm. But the mm. American army were very interested in it because they were trying to devise programs for their wounded warriors, as they call them. Yes coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. So um, they didn't actually use our program, but um, they used bits of it, I'd say. They adapted it in some way. I, I'm very surprised that it wasn't taken up a lot more because, I mean, generally these sort of isolation places or rooms, they wouldn't, the last thing they'd have are windows. Yes. Certainly yes. ones that don't, you know, they wouldn't open. Well, the, the window that one paid, the, in, in our hospital, St. James's, um, it's generally uh, the, the woman that asked for the flowers, there was actually a sort of uh, air conditioning plant right outside her room. So it wasn't a great, nice view. No. And now, depended where you were, you know, uh, some people got had a better view with some grass and flowers and things. But uh, yes. yeah. anyway, yeah. so, um, but you asked me about... Um, medicine and then I moved from medicine and I moved into art history. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked in 20 years in medicine. And then um, along the way, I found this artist, uh, uh, one of my uh, lecturers asked me, uh, said, did I, was I aware of him? His name is Brian O'Doherty. And I said, no, he's an Irish uh, man, uh, qualified as a doctor, did some work in Cambridge University in, in the UK, and then got a scholarship to Harvard and then stayed on in America and became a pioneer of um, uh, cont uh, contemporary art in a number of ways. Um, probably very well known under, he has a number of pseudonyms. Uh, he changed his name to Patrick Ireland after um, Bloody Sunday in Northern Ireland as a kind of an exiles protest about the killing of civil rights uh, marchers. Yeah. Um, but if you want to put up the rope drawing, mm -hmm. he's probably one of the things he's best known for as Patrick Ireland are the rope drawings. And there's one that... Um, this one uh, is now in the collection of the Irish Museum of Modern Art, and it's one a, a signature work. He, this is his um, uh, own invention of, if you remember, Paul Clay wrote that uh, he wanted, I think it was Paul Clay, he wanted to take a line for a walk. So um, 
Brian's uh, uh, entire practice is a lot of it is is drawing, uh, drawing on paper, um, and uh, so this he takes the line for a walk. He takes it out into three dimensional space, so it's in the same space as the viewer. You can walk around this. I always think these should be photographed with someone in them. Um, mm. And then he started painting the walls and relating the ropes and space to the painted configurations on the wall. And um, this one is called Christina's World, and it's um, in the collection of the Irish Museum of Modern Art, 2015. The book I wrote, um, which is the first uh, monograph on his work, came out of my PhD. And um, it's the first book that has looked at this uh, man's work uh, in the round mm -hmm. um, uh, because he's he's quite complicated, uh, very interesting, um, but very quite complicated because of the five pseudonyms. Also, the, but the prominent ones are Brian O'Doherty and Patrick mm -hmm. Ireland. But also, um, he works in many different media. Um, this is quite common nowadays among artists to work in more than one media. It wasn't as common in the 60s and 70s. So he has he has made sculpture, he's made um, objects, he's um, you know done this series of rope drawings which began in the 70s and continue. Um, uh, but he drawing, painting, painting. He didn't paint on an easel for about 30 years. Um, because as a pioneer of conceptual art in New York, uh, easel painting was kind of frowned upon, but um, painting never goes away, of course. And um, so this is a, a book that covers the, the whole range of his work. And it's the only one there at the moment. There are other books, of course, that um, many, many people are very interested in his work now all over the world. Mm. Um, and more books are being produced. Uh, that's my first one. I did another one, if you want to put it up, um, which is based on a series of letters that he, he's been writing letters for about 50 years. And letters, of course, have been supplanted now by, by emails. But so I published this in 2018. The first one was in 2009. And this is 2018. I thought it'd be useful for people. I found his letters very in, insightful and a great way to get into his work and understand what he was trying to do. And so I thought if I found them useful, maybe other people might find the letters I had. Uh, I had them for about 20 years and they're, fr they're from um, to and from people, curators all over the world mm -hmm. and uh, to and from Dorothy Walker, a lot to Dorothy Walker, who was a friend, the critic, the Irish critic, Dorothy Walker. Yes. Uh, she gave me a shoebox full of these letters and um, per gave me permission to use them. So was there one to Yates? Yes. Oh, yes. He he was friendly with Jack B. Yates, the, the brother of W. B. Yates. Mm -hmm. um, he befriended him when he was a, a medical student. And he wrote to him from Cambridge University in the UK when Jack B. Yates was um, in Portobello Nursing Home and where he subsequently died. But the letter I put in the in uh, to W. B. Yates is written by Brian and he was um, encouraging him to try and get back to painting because he had stopped painting after his wife died and um, and he also did the last portrait of Jack B. Yeats. It's a, it's a pen and pencil, very mm -hmm. fine portrait in the collection of the National Gallery of Ireland. And um, he died three, we three weeks after that. I don't know. He seems to have had uh, a, an affinity or a, a talent for befriending uh, older artists. He was also yeah. very friendly with Marcel Duchamp. Yes. And he did the last portrait of Marcel Duchamp, which I don't have an image of to show you, mm -hmm. but it's actually, it was quite, an, it was um, an electrocardiographic tracing of Marcel Duchamp's heartbeat. And it's actually interesting because mm -hmm. uh, he then put that in a box and you know, fitted an oscilloscope to it. So plugging it into the wall, it's, it's as if his, his heartbeat is still uh, alive. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and this is to refute uh, Duchamp's uh, idea that 
once you put art on the wall of a museum, you're you're entombing it and it dies. Mm. So yeah. he was refuting this, um, but he also was friendly with them. But it's interesting. It's also an example, getting back to medicine, of an artwork <laughs> giving a diagnosis in retrospect, because um, I got a cardiologist to look at this uh, electrocardiographic tracing. And uh, he said that it showed evidence of a previous infarct. So he mm. actually had some heart damage yeah. uh, before he before he died. Yes. And that shows up in the artwork, which Gee. is interesting. Very interesting. Um, I did notice on the Yates one, because I, I haven't read the book, hmm. but there's the, the cover, I think, shows the Yates, and, um, or at least it was in the visual. And whilst it's very personal in a lot of ways, and, hmm. and he gets into personal subjects about what, what he should or should not do, yeah. he, refer, he, he addresses them as Mr. Yates. Yes, it, that, that would, well, you see, that was would that be... form for the day? It would have been, I think, and mm. but he had this kind of old fashioned thing, even when he was writing art criticism, uh, say may, uh, writing articles or reviews about Mamie Gillett, he yeah. would say uh, Miss Gillett, you yeah, know, yeah, so yeah. it was a formality, yes. a sort of sign of respect, I think, in, in those days before everyone was going around calling everyone by their uh, Christian name, you know, We're just saying hi, <laughs> first name. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it was more formal time, I think, yes. you know. Yes. But, and tell me, where, where is he now? Is he still alive? Oh, he's still alive. Mm -hmm. He'll be 94 this year. He's, he lives in New York and has lived there for the last, uh, well, 60 years or more. Right. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And you've obviously I, met him, have you? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, yes. I met him first in 1995 here in Ireland mm -hmm. when he was artist in residence down in the Sirius Arts Centre in Cork. Mm -hmm. and um, actually ended up assisting on a, on a wall painting with them. Um, but um, no, no, we, we've known each other now for well over 20 years or more. And yes. we've become friends now once the business part of it was finished, you know. Mm -hmm. If you want to put up the, um, the other thing that got me to Italy, because sure. some Italian friends here are kind enough to turn up today. I just want to talk about how important Italy has become to uh, Sean and I and how lucky we are to be able to uh, live in the country. Yes, for which image, Brenda? Six. It's the uh, Casa di Pinta, the one, you know, the painted oh, yes. house. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it was actually, um, interestingly, the, there's Brian and Barbara in their, um, their Casa di Pinta, which means uh, painted house in Italian. Mm -hmm. And they bought this house in, in Umbria, in uh, Todi in Umbria, um, in the 70s. And then he started painting the walls inside. And this was, a, in a sense, uh, because he's, he's internationally famous for a book he wrote in the 70s, or he, it was a series of essays which became a book called Inside the White Cube, if you want to just pop that well, up quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and basically this book, without going into too much detail, was he coined the, the uh, phrase white cube and there's now used all over the world. I mean, people talk about the white cube, but it was coined by Brian O'Doherty. And um, there's a gallery in London called the White Cube and there's another place called White Space. But um, if you could pop back to Casi di Pinta, Casi di Pinta really is the, the idea behind it is to get back to the, if you like, to uh, prehistory in some ways, where, like, if you go back to Roman times, people lived surrounded by art. It wasn't like it is now that art has become a separate entity, divorced from where your living space. And now this is the, the sitting room that you're looking at. I put the two of them up, if that's all right. That's OK. Yeah. Um, so you're looking down, you're looking from the kitchen past the architrave uh, where you see you might see the um, one here. You can see the word here in the center and uh, at the beginning of now. And oh, um, there's a W there. And these words are words he's used throughout his practice, one here now, which is quite a kind of an existential type of statement that, you know, you can't do anything about the past. What's done is done. You, you can do very little about the future. All you have is now. And what you do now will influence the, the future. So one here now um, is translated into these uh, lines 
which you can see uh, on the architrave there, and you'll see more down in the painting at the back. Um, and he's translated one here now into oh, uh, German, Italian, using uh, this ancient archaic uh, language um, of Oum, O-G-H-A-M, Oum, um, which used to be on standing stones around Ireland um, uh, until uh, the introduction of vellum and people started writing on, on parchment. But so in Ireland, as far as we know, these set of lines could be interpreted, you mean, and have been interpreted, that what they did was translate the 20 letters of the Roman alphabet into a, a different set of lines. Mm -hmm. So, for example, A will be just one line. O, the, the, the vowel O will be two lines, and U will be three lines. E would be four and I would be five. So he uses these fundamentals of language, the vowels, mm -hmm. uh, throughout his practice. And he, as you can see, he can uses them in paintings. He's used them in drawings, oodles of drawings. And so the idea of the painted house really is to invert the white cube space, you know, the kind of sterile, supposedly pure, uh, modernist uh, gallery space. And so this is more like uh, it, it would be a touchstone would be Roman villas and, and uh, you know, where you would, uh, you can see paintings and people living. And you can see that the, the furnishings are extremely simple, um, but this blaze of color is just, uh, it's now one of the most popular tourist sites in uh, Todi, uh, in, in um, uh, Umbria, yeah. and uh, well worth a visit. Um, the whole house is painted. It's on three stories and on two sides, and it's supposed to have Etruscan walls. I don't know, but I have written a text, uh, a kind of a guide uh, for the public uh, to try and help them understand what they're being surrounded with. And but you can enjoy it just as abstract painting and color if you would blaze a color if you wish. But uh, for those who want to know a bit more, I've written this and I'm hopefully get waiting for the local commune to come through with money. They've said they will uh, give support for it. So, and then I'll have, that'll be my trilogy. That'll be my mm. third book. <laughs> That's yes. it on Brian yes. O'Doherty. So and tell, I, tell, us, tell us about the sculpture park. Oh, Sorry, for, for, firstly, you, you spend yeah. time in, in, in Italy every year, don't you? Oh, we do. Sean. Yeah. yeah. We, we live on and off there. And as mm. since, since Sean has retired, mm. thankfully, we're able to spend more and more time. We, we, we spent three months there, uh, came, just came back in November. The autumn in Italy is just absolutely stunning. It's beautiful at any time. It's just an absolutely incredible country um, and very large. And uh, we now feel so at home there. We have terrific friends and um, I, I speak the language uh, <laughs> well enough to get by. I'd like to be better at it. My friend Patrizia, who's on the call today, mm -hmm. does help me. She talks at a rate of knots to me, uh, but um, it's good for me. Um, yeah. But uh, it's a, an incredible language. And of course, I'm interested in language anyway. I uh, have a, a, a little bit of a facility for them. I, I love talking. I love, I love Italian. Yes. And um, so, yes, we spend about six months there on and off. Uh, we've, we've, we're like seagulls. We go to and from, you know, mm. and... Um, mm. But and where, where, where did this uh, sculpture, sculpture park come into well, it? The sculpture park actually, mm -hmm. it, it just came about quite by chance. I, I just had this idea when we went there first. Um, I mean, I got the idea, I got this idea of maybe buying a house if we could in Italy um, from talking to Brian and Barbara and Toady. Uh, I could ask them, how did you find this place? And they told me, and um, then I thought, oh, maybe we could, maybe, maybe. You could you could actually get a mortgage in those days. So yes. we, we did, and um, yeah. we luckily we found this place. So we, um, I also thought there must be contemporary art here in Italy because you're surrounded by Baroque and the wonderful Baroque and wonderful Renaissance. I love them. I love all kinds of art, but um, I was 
I was very keen to find out what was happening now in mm. Italy. Yes. And, you know, in spite of the burden of the Renaissance and the, you know, and the oceans <laughs> of tourists and so on. Sure. So one day I happened to be in a local bar in a town called uh, Rada in Chianti. And I saw this card with sculpture, contemporary sculpture on it and asked uh, uh, Fabrizio, whom we know, where, where is this place? So he told us, we went there, met Piero, Piero and Rosalba, uh, Gidrossi, and um, they have a gallery uh, not very far from uh, where our house is, mm -hmm. a little town called Pievesciata. And it's about 11 kilometers um, north of Siena. So mm. uh, it's um, near Siena. And uh, we became friendly with them. And Piero uh, had a, a piece of land which he owned. And he decided that he's, he was a, a retired businessman. He decided he was going to make this into a sculpture park. So he did. And it became uh, the Chianti Sculpture Park. And one day he just said to me, um, I want to ask you something. Uh, he speaks very good English. And um, I said, what? And he said, I want you to write the catalogue. And I said, uh, I said, well, I couldn't. My Italian wouldn't be good enough. And, uh, you know, so he's no, no, I want you to write it in English because and he was quite right, because I um, I, I don't know if Patrizia would agree with me. I read so many catalogues and the English translation is just so yeah. poor sure. um, yeah. and even in beautifully produced catalogues. So I wrote it in English, having uh, said to him now, Piero, I'm not going to write like an Italian. They write in very, very flowery language, you know, oh, my dear friend and all this I, yes. lovely. Uh, you know, I said, I will write the way I write. And uh, so he said, that's fine. And so it was subsequently translated into German and French, and it's had about three editions. And then now, of course, it's been superseded, if you like, by an app. Yeah. So, but the Sculpture Park is extremely popular. Um, it was voted one of the top in the world at one point. Um, it's really? not a huge park. And of course, it's very much in the tradition of, of sculpture parks and gardens in Tuscany and mm. in Italy generally. Yes. But, yeah. Um, yeah. And we put up some links to that, Brenda. Mm. I was, it got me away from just being a, a touristy foreigner uh, living in, in, in Tuscany. I could yeah. get just a, a little bit under the skin of things and mm. made some good friends and so on. So it was, it was great fun. Great yeah, fun. I can imagine. Yeah, I can enjoyed imagine. it. Mm. Um, Brenda, I think what we'll do now is we, we'll ask uh, people to, to uh, you know, if they have any questions yeah. um, to ask you now, okay? Yeah, we never um, got to the Rosk exhibitions, but anyway... The, we we, we didn't, everything. but there could always be a part two, you know? <laughs> 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 but yes. um, no, we're moving on in time, so I think it's probably best yeah, to, sure. to do that. So, um, that new project, what are there any hospitals in Ireland, or no, let's say in Dublin, because I don't know where else... Um, where that um, project is actually being done. This is the where, open window. Yeah, because it's yeah. That, that's huge. I can see huge potential for the good of the patients for that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Where has it been done? I unfortunately, I have to say that the open window project is no longer uh, operational in St James's Hospital in the transplant unit. It's it it isn't uh, working anymore. Um, for a complex number of reasons. However, to answer the question around Ireland, the Open Window Project, uh, no, I don't think it's been replicated anywhere. Uh, but that isn't to say lots of hospitals in Ireland and, and further, further afield do have uh, introduced art in various ways. Some hospitals have introduced, um, yeah, well, you have art therapists, of course, and then you have... Uh, art collections within gallery, within uh, hospitals. I was on the art committee up in James's Hospital for about ten years, and so uh, yes, there are uh, there is art in hospitals um, and uh, and even further afield. And I should say the Contemporary Irish Art Society here. I think there's some members here. Uh, have done an absolutely wonderful job uh, over the last 60 years. It's our 60th anniversary this year in when there was no budget in uh, e even in museums in the 60s. Uh, the Contemporary Irish Art Society was buying art 
and giving it to hospitals, giving it to universities, giving it to museums, and, uh, and are continuing to do it. Uh, this is our 60th anniversary and they're continuing to do it. But answering your questions, yes, there are lots, a lot more awareness now of the need uh, um, uh, of improving the environment for patients in hospitals. Mm -hmm. Quality of life is what it's called now. And my husband, Sean, has published on this, uh, the, the necessity of quality of life uh, as an extra um, source of, of, I won't say healing, I'm not saying healing, but certainly yes, improving the, yes, somebody has written on the chat that art is medicine. And yes, I, I tend to agree with that. But un unfortunately, doctors are very pressurized. They're very busy um, and uh, they have to keep their idea on the main job, which is getting the patient. Back. But I think more and more uh, doctors and ancillary staff are aware that the environment can be improved as well. There was a time in Ireland, certainly in Ireland, I don't, can't answer for other countries, when you only saw art in children's hospitals. And in fact, when, when Sean introduced art, like he introduced wall painting before the window, open window project, he introduced wall painting in the transplant unit. And um, some, some of the uh, nurses, uh, the response was, oh, I didn't know you could have art in, with an adult hospital. I thought it was only in children's hospitals. So uh, there is an increasing awareness, let's put it that way. I see Marianne yes. said Galway Hospital has an art collection and a poetry competition. Yes. They yeah. frame the winning poem to hang in, in Galway Hospital. So yes. there are loads in the corridors. Catherine has said Waterford Art Healing Trust. Oh, the Healing Trust. Pages exhibitions, yeah, long for patients. established, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah very good. Yeah. Okay, yeah. anyone ask uh, another question? Uh, Alan, different topic or whatever? Alan, yes, Yvonne. You, yeah, sorry. Um, just, hi, Brenda, lovely to hear you. Hi. Again, on that open window um, idea, I'm all for art in hospitals. I cannot go into a hospital. I get depressed in a hospital if I can't see art. Mm -hmm. And as you say, over the years, it has progressed. But just a quick little incident. Um, I have to go in for stress tests um, uh, once or twice. And um, I was in the heart clinic of a private clinic. And we won't say where, but it probably was very near your hospital. And uh, it's a state of the art building. Mm. And I go in and I do my stress test and I get up in the machine and I look to focus somewhere when I'm puffing and puffing. Right. And all I could get was the insignia on the machine. Yeah. So I focused on that. And then suddenly I had a bright idea because the place is just beautifully blue stripes, blue lights, blue everywhere, but not a painting in sight. And so I said to the technician the last time, I said to the technician, I had an idea. I have these big, huge um, photographs. I'm an artist myself, a photographer, whatever. And um, I, I have a blue, a layered, very, very um, soft focus, uh, layered photograph, big. Mm -hmm. And I said, this would be beautiful for everybody, for anybody. Mm -hmm. So I asked the technician, I said, would you be interested if I brought it in? I have something that would be absolutely fantastic up there. And he said, yes, yes, we would. I brought it in, especially. And he took it and I told the doctor as well, blah, blah, blah. And I said, just no questions asked, just put it up there, please. And I knew it was contemporary that it would fit in. So next time I came, the next year, I looked to see, I stood up on my machine, nothing there. Mm. And I went to inquire about it. And eventually they traced it back that one of the managers, that there was a strict rule, no art on the walls. Um, the um, the, the uh, manager had actually taken it for herself and put it up in her office. Oh my goodness. So I still haven't got it. Um, okay. I felt like saying, I really need, I, want, I would like that back yeah. because it wasn't used for the patient. It was the sure. patient that Sure. So that was one little incident. And just the other one that comes to mind, I'm sorry now, um, was when I was giving birth uh, 32 years ago, my first child. And it was so clinical in the hospital. And I, it, my, uh, my labor was very protracted and long and arduous. And at some stage, I thought of something and I said to my husband, 
go home, please. It was nearing the end. Go home and race for a little small framed uh, um, postcard that I had received and signed from Pauline Buick for something. <laughs> Yeah. And on it was, I knew in my head what it was. The image was of a fox, a red fox, uh, trying to catch a eel swimming down a river. I, he brought it back. I propped it up in front of me and I said, the fox is the pain and the eel is my baby running down the birth canal. Mm. Well, it was beautiful, and the birth went swimmingly after that. <laughs> swimmingly, yes. And so I wrote to Pauline Buick, told her of my incident, and she actually included it in, in, a, in a book. But it just my point is that I get depressed when I go into most hospitals. Yeah. But yeah. now oh, yeah. the art mm. is coming in. But when I see a, 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 a lovely big bright painting in, in a wall in a hospital, it just mm. it lifts mm. the spirit. Of course so, it does. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, when I was on the art committee in James's, I, I was trying to persuade them that the one area, I mean, dent, dentist surgeries is the same. So many times you're lying and you're looking up at a blank ceiling. And I've, I've often said, why don't we use the ceiling, you know, as a way? And, you know, floors, you know, and with corridors could be painted every, and repainted uh, different seasons. Like when I was young, I mean, I mean, it, the, the doctors had more say of what went on. Mm -hmm. Now you have this extra layer of bureaucracy. Um, our Kennedy, Royal Victoria Hospital in Belfast has a fantastic art collection. That's Roisin, Roisin Kennedy. Oh, Roisin, thank you, Roisin. Art, art, art story, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Colin Eaton says, great talk. Always a pleasure to meet Brenda at exhibition openings. <laughs> Hi, because Colin. Because you, you are a great patron of the arts, let it be said. Yeah. Margie, many thanks for a different insight into art. Yes, and it is. Okay. That's what I really love about this. You know, yeah. you've brought a completely new perspective to the whole thing. Um, Eilish says, such a pity to hear of the demise of the Open Window Project. Patients need to be understood as human beings first, or as humans first. Mm. Uh, thank you, Alan and Brenda. Mm. Uh, very interesting. Yeah, thank you for that. Have you any particular oh. plans that you'd like to, to tell us well, about? Uh, yes, I have. I have that book in the Casa di Pinta. It's all ready to go. I have a wonderful photographer, George Tachi. Taj, mm -hmm. I think is pronounced in Italian. Yes. Um, all done. <clears throat> and that I want to get that done. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, that's one thing I'm doing. I'm also, as I mentioned, contributing to the Blood Project, which is a much broader project, project than uh, Blood. Um, and uh, I was struck actually um, by, I'm reading an interesting book, actually my husband gave it to me for Christmas. It's called um, the, the World According to Color. And I'm on red at the moment, <laughs> I black, I, black last week. And it's actually a cultural history. Yeah. And it's fascinating. And the red, I'm thinking of the blood project, mm. like we're all red beneath the surface. We have about, what, five liters of blood uh, coursing our, our arteries and veins at the moment, which is about 8% of our, our body weight. And we're making mm. a, so I don't know how many million Andrea could tell us how many millions of red blood cells every second. Uh, yeah. So it's fascinating. But um, my friend, the artist Pam Harris, I think she's on the call too. She, yes, she, she is. Told yeah. me, she told me a number of years ago, fascinating thing. Color red, uh, you know, is associated uh, with the first human being in the Old Testament, Adam, that the word Adam in Hebrew actually means red. Mm -hmm. But I was, I was in this book I'm reading now, The World According to Color, uh, James Fox um, is saying that actually it also means uh, it's linked with the, the, the word blood uh, and also the ground or the earth. So that we as we as man, we, we come from the mythology says we come from the, the earth, the ground. And, and uh, it's just fascinating that in the cave paintings um, in, uh, in, in France and Spain, uh, I haven't seen these now, but I'm reading about them. Mm -hmm. there are, there's red pigment. It was used by our ancestors 300 well, centuries ago. Um, and they would put a handprint onto red pigment, which is a fascinating thing that 
you know, if you were in the cave, you could put your hand over somebody else's hand. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the closure of those hundreds of thousands of years, it's just that they will go to the trouble of making handprints and doing them with red pigment. But yes. apparently they did the animals were done with black charcoal, which is, mm. it's just a fascinating thing. Yeah. So this blood project that Sean and I are involved in, um, it's much, much broader than just the technicalities of what blood is all about. Mm. It's about the cultural history of blood, the embryology of blood, you know, um, and what blood, the blood is actually life. It's a metaphor for life. Yes. And um, so, and so that just gives you an idea that here are um, doctors in in big hospitals in the United States that do have broader views and want to uh, create a better connection with the patients, and uh, so the young doctors can learn. Uh, what what we were trying to do yeah. um, in the blood project and what we're trying to do in the medical humanities. So very um, refreshing, very refreshing. That book sounds interesting too. Well, the bloodproject.com, yeah. so people can look that up if they want. Yeah, um, I'll put that below as well. Just, I just had a, a question. It's one of the things that I'm fascinated about is this, you know, within the art historian, this historical thinking, that link between say Renaissance art and contemporary art and that journey that historians make yeah. towards becoming aware because very few people are writing about contemporary art. Mm. They are writing, they write about contemporary art in a, in a, in a critical sense, you know, just let's, let's do a, an art criticism of a, an exhibition or yeah. an artist rather than in the the I suppose the, the context of cultural norms or cultural yeah. cultural conversations of the day. Well I'm just interesting yeah. in that that where that move you know for you came because I presume when you started looking first you were looking at figurative based Renaissance mm. you know based, then moved towards the the, the Patrick Ireland mm. Rhino Dark. Yeah. Idea. Yeah. It's a very good question, Eamon. Um, and actually, it's something that many of us are aware. Um, we live in a world of sub, sub, sub specialization. And, uh, it, you know, however good that is in some ways, I think there's a loss of looking at the bigger picture. And that uh, translates also into the language that's used around uh, art. And as you mentioned, a lot of contemporary art is written in a critical uh, speak. So it's really critics talking to other critics. Um, I have always tried to steer, steer clear of that. Um, like when I was practicing medicine, I always tried to use language that the patient in my judgment would understand. So I could alter the way I would speak depending on my judgment of what uh, the patient could understand. Um, and it's the same for art. Uh, I'm passionately believe that we can talk about art. And um, uh, many people, uh, many artists, historian friends of mine and colleagues uh, do write about art in a very uh, clear uh, way. And part of our job is to put it into a cultural context. Um, for example, uh, I was commissioned and I'm very delighted uh, to write uh, a chapter on Ireland um, in a book called Hot Art, Cold War. And it's a two volume thing that comes from Edinburgh University. And they're going around all the countries of Europe and they want to know how did uh, Irish, in this case, or English, French, German, uh, respond to American art, you know, uh, during the Cold War. So I wrote about Ireland and um, and hopefully did it in a, in a clear way. And that allowed me to bring in something I was going to talk about when I was doing research on the Rusk exhibitions, um, that Ireland was part of the Cold War. And we did have, um, uh, I, I argue that we, our first Rusk exhibition was funded by the CIA. Um, and uh, so those kind of things people 
uh, don't know about. And I think uh, the broader political and cultural and social things should be brought in to art. Art just doesn't happen in a vacuum. Yeah. Uh, I agree with you. Um, but to your point about art, contemporary art not being written about enough, it's very difficult. I'm on the art critics section, the international art critics and um, the Irish section. And we meet, met the other night. And one of the things we were talking about is how difficult it is for people who want to write about art to be commissioned. You cannot make a living. I know artists have difficulty making a living. Well, as an art writer, you can't make a living out of writing about art or writing art criticism, even as a freelance art historian, you can't make a living. You have to have another job. The broadsheet newspapers have don't have our correspondence anymore. You know, like the Irish Times is our uh, arguably leading uh, newspaper and we've lost uh, the art correspondent there. Um, you, you have more about auction results and you have popular, popular culture and so on, which is all fine uh, in its own right. But there is a huge amount of creativity going on in this country, a massive amount of wonderful exhibitions and they're not being written about, you know, nobody is hearing about them. The artists aren't being served and the future art historians are not getting material that they can use uh, to actually write down a history in the future. So um, it's, a, it's a huge problem, um, but it's, there are people there uh, we, in the art critics, this Irish section, we have 57 people writing about uh, Irish art at the moment. But to find a place to, to put your, your work is very difficult. Yes, yes. And that's why I think Alan's channel here is a wonderful resource. And I applaud him for creating this platform for artists, emerging artists, and established artists and um, and broadening it out to the broader cultural sphere like of, of an art historian, as I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. and art writers and curators. These are all people who write about art, you know, mm -hmm. but it should be beyond the more specialist type of um, journals and uh, you know, commissioned work like I did. Very few people are going to read that chapter that I wrote because it's in a book that would cost uh, hardback that would cost about, I don't know, maybe nearly just less than a hundred pounds. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, oh, I, I, I listen, uh, having, having gone through uh, publishing a book myself, I yeah. know exactly what the, uh, yeah. the, the, the logistics are and the costs and all that kind of thing. It is difficult. Very, 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 very difficult yeah. unless you're sponsored or something. Anyway, yeah. listen, we're, we're going to leave it there. Brenda, okay. thank you so much for, for sharing uh, such you. a wonderful insight into uh, art as it pertains to medicine Thank or, you. and vice versa. Thank I think you. it's fantastic. And um, I, I wish Sean, I'm sure all of us will join in, in wishing Sean a speedy recovery Thank you. and back home so he can make future cameo appearances. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I wish you well. And Andrea there is a great friend of Sean's. Yes. How is Sean? How is Sean? He's, he's coming on. He's fine. He'll be OK. He'll be fine. Thank you, Andrea. He's still in hospital. He is at the moment, yeah, yeah. He, he'd be coming out, I'd say, in the next day or so. Yeah. He just got very dehydrated and just needed to, his sodium was very low, so it just needed to be uh, replaced. So he's coming on. Patrizia says he gets rehydration with a bit of wine. Oh, no, he even went off wine, which really, <laughs> no, he's normally, sick when normally. he goes off wine. Then, he, then, then he's really sick. He is, that's right. Then, he's really then this is... Uh, yeah, I know. He'll be better soon. He'll be better. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, listen, lovely talking to you, Brenda. Thank you, Alan. Uh, I look forward to seeing you again at some stage, and I wish you, you every success in your future. Thank you very much. All right. And thank you all thank for you watching. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Yeah. Yes, thank you indeed. And their numbers, great numbers. Great. And um, uh, more, more will be on the, on the video also. Uh, so thank you all for taking the time this morning. I hope you enjoyed it and got, out, got much. as much out of it as I certainly did. Um, and we're going to do the same thing next week, same time, same day. And I hope you'll join me then. Okay. Thanks, everyone, very much. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Andrea. Ciao. Ciao, Ciao Brenda. Ciao, Brenda. <laughs> Grazie. Ciao, Brenda. Ciao, Bella. Ciao. Ciao. Poi ne parliamo ancora. Sì, sì, sì.